How are you doing today? Everyone doing good? Um, I'm really excited that you're here. Um, I want to try to tell you about how biology is the nanotechnology of the future. And you should all be excited about what we can do with biology, and I want to try to make you excited about that. So why do we care about biology? Biology gives us air that we breathe, it gives us food, it gives us many of the materials you're wearing. So we want to understand biology. And I think that biology is the technology of this century. So tell all your kids they should learn about biology. Uh -huh. Why is biology like engineering? And I like to draw these parallels for you so you can get a sense of what you can do with biology. So first of all, biology is exquisitely sensitive. So your nose, your olfaction system, can detect a single odorant molecule and register a signal in your brain that says, aha, I smell minty or I smell banana. So that is something, that is exquisite sensitivity that any nanomachine would like to have, right? A biology can also send and receive signals. You are getting my signal, you're sending signals back to me and the fact that you're all awake, um, <laughs> that's registering. And that's happening really fast. That's happening in real time. So biology is, is the ultimate technology for sending and receiving specific signals. Now, this is one of my favorite aspects of biology in parallel to engineering. Biology is very modular, as is engineering. So on the right there, I have a drill that can be taken apart. Does anyone know what the first example of interchangeable parts was in technology? It was the revolver the gun. That was invented in America and a really important advance in, in um, engineering to have interchangeable parts. We just accept that now, right? That, you know, something breaks in your car, you get a new part for it, you don't have to replace the whole car. So biology is like that also. So we originally thought that the modular unit of biology was the gene and you can move genes from one place to another. Biology does that naturally, and that can change what the organism is like. But we have learned now from about 30 years of what we call molecular biology, which was partly invented here in Boston, that the modularity of biology extends beyond the gene. We can take genes and make them into little pieces that can be swapped in and out. And these act as interchangeable parts, much like a part for your car. Um, so this is how we now think about biology as we try to build it. Now the last advantage of biology that it has over all those machines that you see around you is that biology can duplicate itself. So a cell can grow and grow and grow, and every time it grows, it makes a replicate of itself. So in, if you make a machine in a cell, you essentially have a self-replicating machine. I'm not talking about the Terminator here. We're not there yet. Um, but I'm going to give you a few little examples of the kinds of machines that we can start to build inside cells. Um, and so we call this area synthetic biology. Which, and the idea behind synthetic biology is to be able to build these little machines in living cells in a predictable way, to do useful things, to make fuels, to help with agriculture, to help make drugs. So there are many uses for biology, and one of them that is very important is to get around the dependency on petroleum. So biology is capable of harvesting sunlight. Sunlight is probably our greatest natural resource on Earth. And we only use about one-tenth of the sunlight that is hitting the Earth. So this is used by plants, a little tiny bit by solar cells. So if we can harness that ability and channel it into making things, we can bypass the need for petroleum. 
most of what is around us is based on petroleum-based products, and we would like to have a world where we are independent of petroleum-based products, and biology should be able to do that for us. So here are some of the things that biology knows how to do that we would like to do. So it can make really complicated things. This is silk being spun out of a spider. Silk is one of the strongest materials. We would like to be able to engineer silk. We would like to be able to make rubber, for example, rubber from sunlight. Um, some of you maybe re may recall that there was a time in our history when all the rubber comes from one part of the world. And during World War II, we could not get access to that rubber. So we, we need ways to be independent. So biology allows us to do that. This structure in the middle is something that we study in my laboratory. This structure fixes carbon. Really important, right? getting carbon out of the atmosphere and using it for useful things. So that's a, something that biology can do really efficiently. So what is life? Um, this is a very simple form of life. This is a bacterial cell. Your gut is filled with them. This, there's probably a ton of them living on this railing. They're on your skin. They're everywhere. Um, but they are highly engineerable. They have compartments. They have DNA, which is where the information is stored that programs the cell. And they have a lot of machinery independent that is encoded by the DNA that tells them what to do. So as bioengineers or synthetic biologists, what we want to capitalize on is the fact that there are compartments, there's information storage, and there's chemical machinery. So this is just like a computer. So we think of this cell as being our computer. We don't completely understand it, but we think we understand it enough that we can start to build parts, put them in, and program these cells to do interesting things. So the general strategy is that we can edit the code of DNA. We can even make the code. So I can make DNA. I can actually order DNA from a company in China. In fact, much of the DNA that is synthesized is made overseas. So we already are part of a global network of synthetic biologists. There is an example of a whole genome of an organism being synthesized. This got a lot of press. Uh, there is a problem with DNA synthesis in that it's still a little expensive and slow, but I'm looking at you, and someday in your lifetime, you will be able to sit at a computer, say, I want to make a cell that does this. You will type in what you need. It will be delivered to your laboratory the next day, and then you will build that cell. Won't that be cool? <laughs> Now, what do we want to do with the code? Well, we want to reprogram cellular functions, and we do that through something called RNA and proteins. You probably don't understand what this means, and someday you won't care what it means. This is just a bunch, this is a bunch of circuitry inside a bacteria, and what we would like to do is put a black box around that. So that would become like your transistor. So someday you will have biological devices where they come as black boxes. And depending on the input, there will be some kind of output. Turning color, sending a signal, making a fuel, secreting a drug into your body. Um, and I'll show you some examples. So we call this abstraction. This is one of the goals for biology. And this is an example. This is what we call the bacterial camera. And this is the result of a project that was actually done as part of a competition, which we call the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition. It was started here by myself and others here at MIT and Harvard, and it has grown to be 150 teams of undergraduate and high school students throughout the world who spend the summer making biological machines. And this was one of the winning prizes. And you don't have to understand what's over here on the right. The point is that these bacteria 
can take in light and send out a message. And in this case, the first one, they had them say, hello world. Hopefully you can see that. And this is all over the internet. Um, we call it the Coley graph. Um, you can see lots of different pictures. You could even order these bacteria in your high school or your elementary school and have kids take pictures of themselves using bacteria. So this is one, an example of a very useful machine that is also fun. All right, this is a more, sort of a more serious example. We would like to tackle global problems. One, of course, is malaria. There is a drug for malaria called artemisinin. It, it comes from a tr the wormwood tree in China. It's, high, it's very expensive. It's hard to synthesize in a laboratory, um, but it is one of the most effective, one of the only effective anti-malarial drugs. We would like to supply it to the third world, right? So we need a cheap way to make this drug. So here you have the wormwood plant and here you have the drug. What synthetic biologists have done is to create yeast cells, which normally you would use to make beer. Instead, they have programmed these yeast cells to make this anti-malarial drug. How did they do that? I'm not going to explain it in detail, but one thing that you have to understand is the money behind doing that. So I'm going to put in my little pitch for science funding. Um, this project caught, was initiated by the Gates Foundation, which is a very philanthropic foundation. They are very interested in solving global problems, and one of those is malaria. They invested $45 million into this project to make yeast cells that can make this anti-malarial drug. This has succeeded. It is now being manufactured by a drug company and will go on the market, I believe, next year. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the problem with that is we would like to make every drug, right? And we would like to make every drug for the third world. But we, there's not $45 million for every project. And that's where I go to the idea that part of what we do is to find ways to program cells that will be faster and cheaper. And that's what's going to happen over the next five to 10 years. So here's a little example of a little bit of a biological computer. One of the things computers can do is remember that they were exposed to a signal. So these are yeast cells, again, that you would use to make beer. They've been exposed to a signal. And what happens is the cells on the right here that are green remember that they've been exposed. The red signal goes away, and the green signal remains for many, many times as the cell divides. So this is the beginning of a little biological computer. So we would like to teach cells to count, to remember. So imagine a cell that could be exposed to a signal count forward and do something, like secrete a drug. So that would be an in incredibly useful therapeutic tool, and that's one of the goals of synthetic biology. Another goal is to design a sustainable earth. Uh, again, I go back to let's get away from petroleum products as much as pro possible, and let's use biology. This is an example of a project that is funded by your tax dollars, by the DOE. Um, it's, it's what we call blue sky science. This is funded by a, uh, something called ARPA-E, which is a very exciting program that is unusual for the government to fund things that almost seem impossible, but if any part of them works, it will be good. And the basic idea is to make a bacteria that will make a transportation compatible fuel by taking in electricity. So that electricity could come from anywhere. It could come from sunlight, it could come from wind. The bacteria would conduct the electricity. They would also fix CO2, so they would help take CO2 out of the environment, and they would produce a fuel. So this is my, my laboratory, together with several others, has funding to work on this, what is a big project. There are 13 laboratories 
or groups throughout the country working on this. We all get together in Washington. We pray that this will be included in the future budget. Um, and if any one part of this works, that will be considered a success. These are an example of bacteria that populate water. They are photosynthetic bacteria. Um, and here's a close-up. So you can see these bacteria. The red outlines the membrane of the bacteria that is responsible for taking in the energy from the sun. And these green structures are where they fix CO2. So these bacteria also hold promise for taking in sunlight and doing things. So for example, we have made them into a food source. We've engineered them to take in light and produce sugar. Sugar is a, very, a high value commodity. Imagine you could put these on a spacecraft and you could have them produce food. This could help with long-term missions to Mars. It could also help with devastated areas that need food and drugs. If you could engineer these, they need very little water. All they need is sunlight. You could put them in a devastated area and help to revive the infrastructure of that area. So that's one of our goals. Okay, so lastly, for fun, um, I was thinking about these bacteria and realized that they are similar to what happens in plants. Um, the bacteria are, are like what we call chloroplasts, which are the little engines inside plant cells that cre harvest sunlight and create energy. So we decided to see if we could make an artificial photosynthetic organism by taking these bacteria and inserting them into a fish. The fish are clear so they can take in light um, and so we can inject them into the beginnings of a fish. This is a fish egg and the fit, it will grow into a fish and every one of these little red dots is one of these light harvesting bacterial machines living inside the fish. And lastly, Here's an example of the fish, and every red dot is one of those bacteria living inside the fish. And you can see the fish develop with the bacteria in it. Now, we, they're not photosynthetic yet, but we're getting there. All right, thank you.